So we started to talk about vector fields and they really are four more topics that we're going to cover this term all in chapter 17. So vector fields, line integrals, what are called conservative vector fields and Green's theorem. Um, that will really finish the semester for us. So we've looked at, so this, go back to section 17.1 on vector fields. We've looked at curves in R2 or R3, this means two-dimensional or three-dimensional space. So a curve, UI usually is R of T, and if it's in two dimensions, it might have an X component and a Y component. And if it were in three dimensions, there might be, there would be a third component, component Z of T. So we can think of a curve as something like this moving in space where T goes, let's say, between A and B. So here is R of A, and think of this as time. As time increases, you move along this curve, and when you get to B, time B, you've ended up over there. So that's a curve. And we also have surfaces. Well, at least in R2, we have a surface. We might have a function Z of two variables, and over some region R in the XY plane, for every point XY, you have this point Z equal F of XY. And you think of that collection of points as giving you some surface uh, S over R. So here, F, so when you had a curve, R was a function of one variable to R2 or R3. If you have a surface or a function of two variables, or it could be a function of three variables, to every vector in R2 or R3, you have one number, f of x, y, or f of x, y, z. So for a curve, we're assigning a vector to a number. To a surface, we're assigning a number to a vector. And <clears throat> the generalization of that, is, which is really very straightforward and very simple, is you have a function that's called capital F. Let's say it's a function of two variables, and its value is always a function of a vector and two variables. So a vector field assigns to every vector x, y, a new vector whose coordinates are f of x, y, and g of x, y. Or you might write this as f of x, y, i, plus g of x, y, j. So this is a vector field in two dimensions. Given a vector in two dimensions, x, y, you create a new vector in two dimensions. And we saw the simplest uh, of all possible examples. Uh, you might have the vector field f of x, y, which is the vector, gives you the vector 2x, 2y, or 2xi plus 2yj. So that's an example of a vector field. For example, at the point 1, 1, f of 1, 1, when x and 1 and y is 1, is 2, 2. So at this point, there's a vector there. Or f of 1 minus 1 would be 2 minus 2. So here's 1 minus 1, and that gets sent to the vector 2 minus 2. 
And at every point in the plane, the vector field assigns a vector at that point, which we often draw or graph by at the point, at any point, a, b, you draw the vector f of a, b, with the tail at a, b, and the head wherever it lands. So that's a vector field. And it's interesting to graph some of these. So um, for example, you might have the vector field. This one again is very simple. f of x, y is equal to the vector zero x. Or in terms of i and j, f of x, y is x times j. So you notice if you look at this vector field, it doesn't depend on y at all. So for any value of y, it only depends on x. So for any point, uh, for example, f of one, zero, here's one. So you take any point, one comma y. So at that point, f of one y is equal to one j. That's just, it's a unit vector pointing straight up. At every point on the line x equal one, this is the vector field. If you take f of zero y, that's zero j. At every point on the y axis, the line x equals zero, the vector is the zero vector. f of minus one y is minus j. At every point on this line, we have a unit vector pointing down. On any point on the line x equal two, you have a unit vector, you have a vector of length two pointing straight up. So this is, um, if you like, a graph or a picture of this vector field. It's called a shearing field, a shear field. Um, but the name's not important. Um, that's what it looks like. What's another example of a vector field? So we have f of x, y equal one minus y squared zero, or y in absolute value less than or equal to one. That means we're only considering this vector field for y between plus one and minus one. So zero, one, minus one. We're only looking, this vector field is only defined in this horizontal strip. And again, you'll see this doesn't depend on X. It only depends on Y. So for example, along the line Y equals zero, F of X, Y, so F of X zero is one zero, that's just I. So all for any point on this line, the vector field is just going one unit to the right. What about on a half or minus a half? So f of x and plus or minus a half, this is one minus a half squared comma zero, that's three fourths comma zero, or three fourths j, a three fourths i. So on this line, the arrows are a little bit shorter. And suppose you go to three fourths. So F of zero comma three fourths is one minus three fourths squared comma zero. This is nine sixteenths, that's seven sixteenths zero. Or seven over 16 I, so that's a little smaller. And in fact, you can see from this that when y is equal to, to one or minus one, the value of this vector field is the zero vector. And as you get closer and closer to the edges of this 
strip, the vector fields, the vectors approach zero. They're getting smaller and smaller. And this is actually a model of what might be called fluid flow through, um, well, for example, a blood vessel, a vein, or artery, or a blood vessel. That is, the blood closest to the blood vessel isn't moving, and the center is moving fastest. And then when people make mathematical models of blood flow, this is part of it. Let's look at one more example of a vector field. So you take f of x, y equal to the vector minus y comma x. Now this is actually an example of what is called a rotation field. Let's see. Suppose I take the vector one zero. So f of one zero is zero one. Suppose I take the vector f of zero one. That's minus one zero. Suppose I take the vector f of minus one zero. That's x equals minus one, y is zero. Oops. X equals minus one zero. Y is zero. X is minus one. What about f of zero minus one? So y is minus one, so minus y is one, and x is zero. What about at this point that say one over root two, one over root two? Let's look at this on the unit circle. F of one over root two, one over root two is minus one over root two, one over root two. That looks like that. And in fact, if you were to graph this vector field at points on the unit circle, this is what the vector field looks like. It really is showing you a kind of rotation. Um, and all of these different kinds of vector fields come up everywhere in science. A simplest vector field, and one of the most important, is called a radial vector field. So f of x, y is radial if it has the following property. At any point x, y, the vector f of x, y is pointing away from the origin along the line from the origin to the point to the vector x, y. So at any point, a radial vector field would look like that. It's always pointing away from the origin. So the general form of a radial vector field would be f of x, y is equal to some scalar times r, where um, r is the vector x, y. So at any point for a radial vector field, the vector field is a vector pointing away from the origin. And there's a simple kind, for example, where f of x, y is equal to the vector r divided by the length of r raised to some power. If you have, for example, a circle, at any point on the circle, there's you can define a vector field. One is the tangent vector. Um,
at a point x, y. And the other is the radius vector. Or the normal vector, which is the vector perpendicular to the tangent, the radius vector. In fact, the normal vector, so if you have a circle, x squared plus y squared equals one, for example, at any point on the circle, so this, the circle x squared plus y squared equals one, this is a, the level curve. If you take the function g of x, y equal x squared plus y squared, the level curve g of x, y equal one is the circle. And the gradient of G at X, Y is the partial of G with respect to X and the partial of G with respect to Y. It's actually a radian, radial vector field. And the gradient, delta G of X, Y is that. And this is always normal to or perpendicular to the tangent vector. Partly because you know from high school geometry that the radius is always perpendicular to the tangent. But if you write this circle, um, the unit tangent vector at any point, so if this is the point x comma y, this has slope y over x, the unit tangent has slope perpendicular to that. So the slope is the negative reciprocal minus x over y. So this vector would be some tangent of x would be some scalar times one minus x over y or some scalar times um, y times minus x. And if you want this to have absolute value one to be the unit tangent, this would be y minus x or minus yx over the square root of x squared plus y squared. And you can see that this vector and this vector are perpendicular. The dot product is zero because you get 2xy minus 2x1. Okay, so these are. Um, um, kind of review of vector fields. We talked about this on Monday. Um, there's one very important vector field that's associated with uh, a function. So suppose we have a function phi, which is differentiable. That means it has partial derivatives. Phi differentiable on some region in R2 or R3, the gradient, which is the vector partial of phi with respect to f, x partial of phi with respect to y, this is a vector field. This is called a gradient field because this vector field is the gradient of a scalar function. And phi is called a potential function. Or the vector field F. So if you have a scalar function and you take its gradient, you get a vector field. Conversely, if you have a vector field, there may or may not be a scalar function for which the vector field is the gradient of the scalar function. 
a vector field that has that property is called conservative. And conservative vector fields are things that are very important and they're extremely important in physics, for example, if you study electricity and magnetism. Okay. Um, so, So when you have a vector field F, this vector field assigns a vector at every point in a certain region of the plane. And suppose we have a curve C given by R of T. Let's say it's a curve in two dimensional space. So it has two coordinates, X of T and Y of T. They're T between A and B. So so here we have the curve r of t and what i want to define is what is called the line integral of F along the curve C. And I'm going to start with a simpler case of this, where instead of a vector field, we have a scalar function, F of X, Y. And I wanted to find the line integral of F of X, Y, this is the notation. The integral over the curve C of this function f of x, y, ds. And I have to explain what this means, how we define such a thing. So it's very similar to how we define an ordinary integral. So let me start with the clean piece of paper. So first, we have some curve R of T. So this is defined for T between A and B. So if you like, you can think of the interval from A to B, and this is R of A, and we go along the curve and we end up at R of B. Now we can take this interval from A to B and divide it up into, let's say, N pieces. They could be the same length, it's not important. Uh -huh. But we take the interval from A to B and divide it up into N pieces. And then along the curve, we have points R at T1, R at T2, R at T3 in general. This is R of T sub N, the last point. This is R of T0, the starting point. So I've divided my curve up into pieces. And if I take some subinterval, say this is t sub k and this is t sub k minus one. So on the curve, here's t sub k minus one and here's t sub k. Sorry, this is r of tk minus one. This is r of tk. So this curve, this little segment of the curve has some length. I'll call that length delta s sub k. And if I take some point t sub k star on the curve, this is r at t k star. So I take a number between t k minus one and t k, r to call t k star, r t k star is some point on that curve. And I can evaluate f at this point, f at r of t sub k star. 
And now I take this number, F, at R of T, K star. So its components are X of T, K star, comma, Y of T sub K star, times the length of this segment of the curve. And I add this up for all of the pieces, the end pieces into which I've divided the curve. So I have my curve. I divide it up into end pieces. In each piece, I pick a point and I evaluate my function at that point. That times the length of this piece of the curve. I add this up as k goes from one to n. And if it happens that the limit of this is n goes to infinity, and these pieces all get smaller and smaller and smaller. If that limit exists, this is exactly what we call the line integral, the integral of f of x of t, y of t, ds. So this is the definition of the line integral of a function. And this is what we'll be studying for the rest of the semester. So if you feel like this is the abstract definition of a line integral, and the question is always, how do you calculate it? Well, the first thing we have to do is to write this ds in terms of t. And for this, you have to recall something that was in the Math 176, the Calc 2 syllabus, which is if you have a curve, R of t, what is the length? So the length of the curve, S of t, suppose I want to find the length between um, A and t. So S of t is the integral from A to t of the absolute value of r prime of u du. Or in terms of its coordinates, this is the integral from a to t, square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t, y prime of u squared, x prime of u squared, y prime of u squared du. So for math 176, this is one of the two formulas you learn for computing the length of a curve. So from that formula, this says that ds dt is equal to the absolute value of r prime of t. So you can write ds as the absolute value of r prime of t dt. Now you really need more advanced calculus to prove that this makes sense. But this is sort of the obvious formula that you come that comes from this that you can write down. So if we have the integral from over C of a function f ds, if this is given by a curve r of t where t goes from a to b, this is going to be the integral from a to b, f of x of t comma y of t, and ds becomes the absolute value of r prime of t dt. So this is the magic formula you have to use to compute a line integral. If I write everything in terms of x and t and y of t, this is f of x of t comma y of t square root x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared dt. So this is the formula for a line integral. And let me now do some examples. This is the important thing. Suppose we have a circular plate. And so this is x squared plus y squared less than or equal to one. And so that's my region R. And I have a curve, which is the boundary. 
So C is the circle, x squared plus y squared equals one. And this can be parametrized by R of T is cosine T comma sine T for T between zero and two pi. So R prime of T, we differentiate this is derivative of the cosine is minus the sine. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. And suppose the temperature on the circle is given by a function t of x, y equal to 100 x squared plus 2 y squared. And we want to find the average temperature on the boundary of the, on the circle, on the, on the boundary of this disk. So that's going to be the integral around the curve divided by the length of the curve. So I want to compute first the integral around the curve C of T dS. So this curve C is given by R of T for T going from zero to two pi. T of X, Y, is 100 x squared plus 2y squared. x is cosine t and y is sine t. Cosine squared t plus 2 sine squared t times the absolute value of r prime of t. If r prime of t is minus sine t cosine t, the absolute value of this vector is the square root of sine squared t plus cosine squared t, which is just one. So this is just times one dt. So this line integral is just this integral, which isn't hard to do. You could also write this, I take the 100 outside. The integral of cosine squared plus sine squared is one plus another sine squared, one plus sine squared t dt from zero to two pi. That's the line integral around the boundary on the curve, which is the boundary of this disk. And this integral, um, you should be able to do. Let's do one or two more examples and then we'll be done for the morning. So this is a line integral in R3. In this case, the integral along a curve in R3 is defined to be the integral from A to B. F is a function of three variables, x of t, y of t, z of t, times the square root of x prime of t squared, y prime of t squared, z prime of t squared, dt. So let's do an example. So C is going to be the curve in R3 which is just going to be this straight line in R3 from the point P with coordinates one, zero, zero to the point Q with coordinates zero, one, one. So this is the point P coordinates one, zero, zero. And in the yz plane, this is the point Q with coordinates 0, 1, 1. So this is Q and this is P. And I need somehow to write a curve, parametrize the straight line that goes from P to Q. So I'm starting at 1, 0, 0. And I'm ending up at 0, 1, 1, which is like the point 1, 0, 0 
plus the point minus one, one, one. Right? Right, this one, zero, zero, and minus one, one, one is the point zero, one, one. So if I look at the point and look at the function r of t, which is one, zero, zero, plus t times minus one, one, one. This is a straight line. And when t is zero, you're at one, zero, zero. And when t is one, you're at the point zero, one, one. So this is a parametrization of the line C. And suppose I have the function f of x, y, z is equal to x, y plus 2z. See, what is this function r of t? Let me write it out exactly. This r of t is 1 minus t, t, t. That's r of t. So this is x of t, this is y of t, this is z of t. R prime of t, when I differentiate, is minus 1, 1, 1. And the absolute value of this is equal to the square root of 3. The length of that vector is the square root of 3. It's the square root of minus 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared, which is the square root of 3. So along this curve C, we write the integral as follows. It's the integral, t goes from 0 to 1, xy plus 2z. So x is, x of t is 1 minus t, y of t and z of t are equal to, to t. So this is xy. 1 minus t times t plus, sorry, yeah, that's right, x, y, 1 minus t times t plus 2z plus 2t, square root of 3, dt. This is the square root of 3, the integral from 0 to 1, t minus t squared plus 2t, that's 3t minus t squared dt. Well, that's easy. That's root 3, 3t squared over 2 minus t cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to 1. That's root 3 times 3 halves minus a third. That's 9, 6 minus 2, 6. That's 7 root 3 over 6. And that's the integral. So these are our first examples of line integrals. These are line integrals of a scalar function along a curve. And the textbook for our course is excellent and um, with very good pictures and I think everything clearly described. So your um, mission, if you like, for Thanksgiving weekend is to study um, the first half at least, well, section 17.1, and the first half at least of section 17.2 on line integrals of scalar functions. And then next week on Monday, we will learn about line integrals of vector fields. Okay. Any questions about anything that we've just done? Uh, on that uh, exam three on uh, my lab on the website, I changed the due date uh, to, um, I think, December, first week in December. And you can take it, redo the exam if you like, and you get the higher score. But it shouldn't be that if you miss the exam or you should have a problem taking it, it should be easy to do now. Yeah, Professor, I don't see it. Will it be available next week? Exam three? Okay. I'm sorry. Will what be available? 
Well, uh, exam three, you just said um, that it'll be due on the first week of December, but well, whatever it was, it was originally due, I think something like November 16th or so. It was, mm -hmm. And I, and I went on into the website and I changed the, if it, and I changed the due date. So you have at least another week or a week and a half. Yeah, because like when I go to like um, my assignments, it doesn't show up. So will it show up like next week or? It should show up now because I did this last night. Um, so if, if, if you have trouble with it, send me an email and I'll try to fix it up. Yeah, because I'm trying to look at it right now because I have my math lab open. Um, so the, and it, what does it have for the due date? It, there's no due date like it's it doesn't show up at like at all like in your assignments doesn't show it is that because you did it already once no i didn't do it yet i didn't do it already once it's just like i remember it was there right and it said past due but now it's just not showing up at all on um, our assignments i'll try this i'll go into the website later i mean i have a lot of trouble with the administration part of the website so um but i'll try to for me. clean it up Okay. Huh. Yeah. Uh, but no one will be penalized uh, in any way for this. Uh, I mean, you can't be penalized because the website is too uh, messy for the administrator. Yeah, that's okay, Professor. It's, I don't know, like, I, I know a couple of professors that have a hard time with um rescheduling it, everything because like my math lab has like a set on um, time and day for everything. Yeah, I know it's, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you don't have this problem when you meet on campus as an ordinary traditional class, of course, but um, with the Zoom uh, things, it's different. Any other questions or comments? Uh, if not, then I wish everyone a pleasant Thanksgiving and we'll be back on Monday. Bye all. You too, Professor. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Professor. Yes. Bye bye.